So virtual and augmented reality accessibility. To quote Donald Trump Jr., I love it. Um, I've got to be topical. So uh, we're going to be basically everything at uh, bit.ly slash EEVRAR. It's basically a code pen of all the citations of the illustrations that I'm using in this presentation. I'm quite new to this field. Um, I'm an idea person. I'm a demonstration person. So basically everything that I'm showing you in this presentation comes from a lot of great work um, from people that have been working in this space. And I guess a key point for me in this presentation today, I'm going to start a little bit with my own history. But a key point of my presentation is that you know VR and AR are happening now. You know, there's tons of companies working in this space. Um, I don't see any reason for accessibility standards, accessibility guidelines to be waiting. There really shouldn't be a delay in those experiences being accessible. Um, the argument or the idea that these are very new technologies, you know, this is partially, you know, I've worked in the field for 15 years to show you how old I've gotten in this field. I feel like most of the concepts stay the same. And so I guess my own spin on what I'm going to be showing you today is that looking at what's currently happening in this space and looking what, at what has been done with technology in the past, I think we should all be advocating for a faster uh, requirements and faster standards for people that build technologies in this space. Because <clears throat> honestly, I don't really feel like there's any excuse not to be doing that now. Apply existing accessibility guidelines to VR, AR. So I am going to be showing mostly tying the demonstrations that I do kind of into the geeky nomenclature of the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, I think what the W3C, the work that they do to build guidelines and standards for technology is awesome. Um, I think a lot of what's already been set into the web content accessibility guidelines, even though it's called web, it basically applies to virtual and augmented reality technologies. So that's the premise of my presentation, is to tie the demonstrations that I show you to those existing guidelines. Be accessible ASAP. Um, I, I loved just uh, the, I presented this presentation in San Francisco last week. Um, so I've actually practiced this once, guys. <laughs> and um, the, the, on the day that I gave that presentation, there was a tweet. It was the iPhone's 10-year anniversary. And the iPhone, you know, has been an awesome device for accessibility. Uh, but Pratik Patel, on that particular day, I'd seen a post from him. He said, happy birthday. It's the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone but the eight-year anniversary of the iPhone being accessible. And, you know, that's super powerful. I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for Apple and what they've done with, you know, iOS and making accessibility more mainstream and building it into the platform. But it's still interesting to look back to that and say, okay, there was two years of that technology not being accessible and available. And it's the exact same point of view, really, with VR, AR, is, you know, it really takes, you know, hopefully Apple and working on their AR kit and other technologies, but it takes these companies building that in and making it available and accessible. We basically don't want a lot of things I'll be showing you are demonstrations, illustrations of how to make this stuff accessible. But it needs to be in a platform. It needs to be available for other developers, people that are just working and trying to build their first app or their second app in this space. They need guidelines and they need techniques uh, for how they actually make that accessible to everyone. <clears throat> so my, my own history, you know, I started in 2002, me working at Chapel Hill. Um, my first project was working with a student who was blind in the classics department. Um, to access ancient world maps. So this is very low resolution. Remember 2002? This is, this is the kind of quality of graphics you could get for those that can't see it. It's a, it's a little hard to see the map here. But there was a lot of data points on that map. And for me, conceptually, in 2002, this is my first entry into accessibility, was how would you take a visualization of an ancient world map and make it accessible to a person that was blind very stimulating for me. You know, we used a touchpad, we used haptic sensors, we used 3D sound. 
all of these technologies are all also very current in VR and AR. Um, but I guess why I show that this happened in 2002 is that you know I've recently, as recent as this year, worked on map accessibility for the web and seen that they're still pretty prevalent that maps aren't accessible to people with disabilities on the web. So even though as an academic or working in undergraduate computer science, I got the experience of, okay, I, I've learned a way to make um, this particular map accessible, that still didn't become a pattern or a practice that enabled accessibility really broadly. And so that, that's a big point from my own experience working in, in accessibility is that I do believe a lot in the standards and the guidelines because you can illustrate something, you can demonstrate something. I was really motivated in making this map accessible, but my own career path didn't really keep me working in maps. And 15 years later, I can still see there's quite a lot of barriers uh, with maps and accessibility. Uh, my next job was working at Microsoft. <clears throat> First job out of school, Windows Vista time frame. Exciting time to be at Microsoft. Um, that's a little sarcasm in the tone. Um, the, <laughs> uh, what was interesting there was that I was a you know, student coming from school, coming to Microsoft, really working on like the dominant um, operating system for accessibility. And I, I guess I just point out that I felt like I did have a lot of responsibility in the space, but there was not like this huge resource of information on the web. Like if I wanted to actually advance myself as someone pretty new to the area, it, it really came from like Section 508, which was a US standard. It was 16 lines of text. You know, there wasn't like this rich set of information of how are you supposed to do this? What are the guidelines? And so, you know, I did my best, but I kind of look at like where we are now and I see that it's really awesome that we have had enough time to build a lot of these patterns, document so many things. And obviously if I was in this role, and had access to the information that I have now, uh, I would have made different decisions you know, on that platform at that time. I also worked from 2007 to 2012, kind of worked more, tried to go open source, worked with Mozilla. I worked with the W3C. I worked on the ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Application Specification like 2007 to 2012, I made a, like a music player where you could search YouTube, no advertisements, and uh, queue up a bunch of songs and make a playlist. And I, I used that to illustrate how to build an accessible web application, which again, going to my point that I had worked at, uh, on the desktop with Windows Vista and seen pretty much how to make something accessible. Still in this time frame, it was very difficult to make something that used to work accessibly on the desktop accessible on the web. Like this was not a very complicated web application, but to build something with like um, sliders and with dynamic lists, uh, the patterns were being developed at the W3C, but they weren't really supported in the technologies. Like now a technology like this would work really great. In 2017, the ARIA specification has matured, it's actually gone through this whole process. Uh, you can use Google Chrome, Apple Safari, Internet Explorer, Firefox, uh, they all kind of work consistently. When I built this back in 2007, 2012, it would work most of the features in Firefox. You know, so it'd be like, great, you could show someone an accessible experience in Firefox, but not in any of the browsers that probably most users with disabilities are actually using to access the web. Uh, then I've also done a lot of work in training. I just point up here in the more recent years, mobile development, iOS, Android, you know, they have done a lot more to build accessibility into the platforms. Um, but still similarly, I would say that most of the requirements, most of the work that I saw in training people and how to make mobile applications accessible on mobile, they were still very similar to what had to be done on the web and what had to be done on the desktop. The principles were the same. The APIs were you know, slightly different, but conceptually, other than touch input, the APIs are basically the same from what I worked on in like 2002 at Windows Vista, which kind of leads me up to um, the most recent project that my company worked on. We worked on the Winn-Dixie case, which I'm very proud of, of like getting accessibility applicable to 
the web. So in this case, um, it's a website you know, that was not accessible in the case or inside of the litigation to show that a website is not accessible. One of the only ways to actually prove that in a court of law or explain that to someone is to say, you're not meeting this technical standard. So I'm gonna again emphasize the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and the work from the W3C. The fact that that specification is so spelled out and so kind of black and white is something I think is very important for getting technology accessible. You know, kind of without being able to reference a technical standard as like an expert witness in a, in a case like to say that this needs to be accessible, it's much harder to argue that, you know, with lawyers that aren't gonna be technology experts, but when you can point to a standard, um, you actually have something to base that off of. And so that's, all of this is leading up to why I'm gonna, when I talk through um, VR and AR, which is most of the demos, I think we should think of it in that lens and we should be advocating sooner than later to be having VR and AR experiences apply into technical standards to push this along. So we're gonna start with 1.1.1, uh, text alternatives, which is sort of the, the first accessibility requirement when you think about the World Wide Web, uh, the first graphical internet browser. We had images. As soon as images were put into a graphical browser, we need to have a text alternative for an image. We need to have an alt text. So if you look at what's been done in the VR space, this is actually from 2010 uh, research from Ilke Fulmer and University of Nevada. Um, he did research in Second Life, and I think Second Life is really interesting to look at uh, as a precursor to everything that's happening, especially in virtual reality uh, experiences, to say that Second Life, while not something that really went mainstream, did have quite a lot of users, and it has had a lot of accessibility work um, inside of it. So Ilke Fulmer, him and his team at University of Nevada, they did a study to look at objects inside of the virtual world Second Life. And they found that 31% of the 350,000 objects in the 433 regions that they studied in Second Life had uh, basically an alt text of object, which I think should sound pretty familiar for us that have worked on the web, mobile, desktop, basically like a worthless text alternative for the objects that exist inside of virtual reality. And I, I would probably argue 31% uh, is probably much higher than that. Like the other, you know, almost 60% probably are still not really great text alternatives. They just weren't the word object, which is sort of the default piece. So now I'm gonna show you a, um, I'm going to show you a video. This is very current. I actually downloaded Second Life. I went into virtual, well, it's virtual reality. And I wanna illustrate kind of the idea of inside of Second Life, how text alternatives work and just an experience that could occur in Second Life. So inside of this environment, um, I'm basically, my avatar is wearing an owl on its shoulder. Great, I can do that. Um, but I'm looking at a plate of food, uh, a, a table that contains you know, multiple plates of food. There's asparagus, cucumbers, salads, plates, uh, forks, knives, something cooking on the grill, some bread. These are all things I can see inside of the virtual environment. But inside of Second Life, you can basically right click and query objects in that environment for text alternatives. And what's interesting here is that you basically have the same pr principle that, again, we already see on the web or in mobile applications where all of these objects are grouped into like a single object. They're basically just an entire table of elements. So there wouldn't have been a way in this current environment to actually label individual, you know, asparagus, uh, bread. And again, text alternatives, Sean's presentation, we talked about text alternatives. Context is important. Maybe I'll need to know that that table has uh, a bunch of food on it, but it, you know, again, in the context, we don't really know how these things are gonna be used in virtual reality. Maybe it does matter that there's asparagus, there's bread. You know, we actually need more specifics. So 
It's interesting that in the mechanics of the game, depending on how you group objects together, you have facilities to give um, text alternatives to those objects. Um, in that particular object, so I right click it inside of Second Life. Uh, again, not much different than what you would see in like uh, the editor for Xcode or Android Studio. There's a name and a description for that particular object, and the name of that object was SM dash deluxe dinner buffet v2 parentheses mesh. Uh, which again sounds familiar. I, I recognize these kind of horrible text alternatives. Yeah. Yes. Yes. As far as workflow goes for a developer, when do you put those up texts in at the end? So inside of Second Life, they basically had a higher level object. They do have these attributes, name and description, which you would be able to, as a creator of the object and putting it into Second Life, you can set those. So there have been other projects where they were set after the fact, but you know, my position would be the author of whoever created this dinner buffet should be the person responsible for setting the name. And you know, if someone else comes and views that buffet, that name should be set. But um, basically, it could happen at multiple times. There had been a research project to set them after the fact. And basically, because most people weren't labeling them, uh, the same team from University of Nevada <laughs> built an app where you could go in and add labels to objects after the fact. So it could happen at different times. Um, uh, again, just showing this illustration visually that you, you could, if that, those objects, whoever designed this, I mean, they could have been broken up into uh, separate objects. They didn't have to be grouped together. Maybe the asparagus should always be on the left of the cucumber to, to follow certain dining rules in, in some, some uh, culture somewhere. Um, but they, you know, again, they grouped everything together, so you wouldn't really have that mechanism to individually label elements, but I think the point is that especially as it gets more sophisticated, I mean, this is still from like probably an older build of virtual reality. I mean, you have objects when you are designing things in virtual worlds, you are working at a smaller object level, and you could give individual alternatives and give higher grouped alternatives. Um, so here I'm showing, I decided to go to the beach in Second Life, you know, it's like, need to relax. And uh, here we actually have a good text alternative so that there's a bar, I think this is like somewhere, oh, Honolulu. Um, it actually had a, a correct name property for that element called Bahia Tiki dash Honolulu Tiki Bar. So it actually had like a good text alternative supplied for it in that particular level of that particular world. And what's cool about that, and again, I illustrate to show that all these things already existed in Second Life, so we could have this currently in VR experiences now. Um, they had actually built these virtual assistant guide dogs inside of Second Life, which were like AI bots, basically, that could lead digital avatars to named objects, so you could tell the guide dog, I want to go to Bahia Tiki Bar. If it's labeled correctly, like in the virtual world, the guide dog is actually leading your avatar like to that position. You know, and I think that's like really cool that they have already built, you know, AI objects in that space that had that type of logic and had that interface. Um, also calling out visually on the screen, there's also a woman um, using a, uh, a white cane to access the environment. So again, it's not saying you have to use a guide dog um, in virtual reality, just like you don't have to use a guide dog in the real world. And I think that's pretty cool that they've built these objects and they've built these experiences into that. And I'll touch on this later, but I do think this is something obviously missing from experiences where you're trying to, to represent uh, yourself in the digital world. It's pretty rare to see people with disabilities represented as like avatar options. And so again, I would have that, that's actually not a WCAG guideline or a web content accessibility <laughs> guideline, maybe it should be, but um, I think it's, it's cool that that happened there. And again, it's cool that those objects, the guide dogs actually had 
you know, AI implementations that could use the accessibility alternatives. Um, and then this is sort of my point here is to look at our current world. Um, basically, there's a lot of people designing objects for virtual experiences, and you basically sell these objects, or you know, you typically sell these objects through like an asset store. And so Second Life was like one big world where it, it kind of was its own economy, but in sort of current space of like Unity and these other platforms, it's like a development platform where you grab these objects and you bring them into your game. And so my point is that, you know, if I searched for, say, asparagus inside of this asset store, because, you know, I'm just obsessed with asparagus, um, I can search for that in the asset store, right? It has a label. In this case, it's actually a file name. But in several of these um, environments, they already have titles and descriptions. And again, this feels very reminiscent of people saying, you should have good page titles, you should have good heading tags in your documents so that Google can index you. Obviously, if you're trying to sell your virtual objects, they need to have good descriptions. They need to be very descriptive. So it's kind of a little much to quote, quote myself here, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm just going to do it. Uh, uh, capitalism and text alternatives. I think, you know, hey, if you're trying to sell stuff, which, you know, we are in America, uh, all those things, all of those descriptions, all of those titles that you're typing into these stores, those should just carry through into the virtual environment. Like if you're already supplying that information for someone to search to find it, to buy it, like it just should carry through. Um, I felt the same way about like Facebook stickers, emojis, all of those other concepts where we have these digital assets. Sometimes you see those carry through, um, sometimes you don't. But I feel like that's something that could very easily happen now that people are already supplying these descriptions. But for example, in Unity, there's not a property to look for like the name of an object, the description of an object. There's not an ecosystem yet, right, where someone would build like a virtual guide dog inside of Unity um, and let someone query what elements are in there. But it could happen soon. And it's 1.1.1 text alternatives. All right, so now this is a um, augmented reality, sort of same concept though, that I saw this presentation, uh, a previous version of this presentation at CSUN, <coughs> uh, the disability conference uh, in California. Dr. Ara Gans from the University of Massachusetts Amherst basically built virtual renderings of real world spaces in, into virtual reality and labeled all of those objects. So you could either explore walking around in a virtual environment at your home, maybe with an orientation and mobility specialist, or you could actually go into the real world place and have the reality augmented with tags and other objects to actually know what room you're in. Um, so I'm gonna just play the video really quickly, just a short part of the video to show um, the student navigating at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, he's actually going to be looking for the Disability Studies office in a certain building. Ooh, and I didn't test that the sound is not playing. Check that. Um, I'm on the HDMI. Yeah. Yeah, we'll use our caption. All he has to do is scan his percept tag, and he's told he's in the second floor of the environment. And now he has a list of destinations within the building on his Android. And so he can type, he can basically go through that list. Um, he has an edit box where he can type in numbers. And so he's typing in the room number 200, uh, sorry, 230 or 233, and there's a filtered list that's occurring, so he's basically filtering all the rooms inside of that environment, and then he's receiving a set of directions that he can then follow that will say, like, walk forward, you know, 20 steps, there's gonna be an elevator, or look for the button. Um, there's, there's an elevator instead of stairs to access each level. Your current location is the second floor. 
Yes, yeah, so at each of these main waypoints, there's like a Bluetooth, or I'm not sure if it's Bluetooth, but there's a sensor that basically interacts with the phone that makes a chime sound to basically tell you you're at the next landmark. And that, that's actually what updates the directions in the phone to say that you've gotten to the next sequence. So I think that's actually right here. He got to the elevator, and his phone is telling him, uh, turn right. You will reach an opening. This is an intersecting hallway. Select next instructions button. The and audio feature is whatever the voice of that Android device is reading that text. Yeah, that and that's what I liked about this project was that it was built natively into just using TalkBack on Android. So the it's the Android TalkBack voice, and it's just use it's just an app running on on it, and they load different um, environments. The one that I saw at CSUN was they actually navigated. Um, the metro, like a subway station, so it could tell you you're going to the blue line or the yellow line um, inside of Boston. You know, you could tell if you're going downstairs, upstairs. Uh, it was really cool, and they had let people practice it before they even went to the subway in virtual reality. So you could be like, oh, the uh, the ATM or the machine to buy the ticket is to the right here, the the place to walk through. Um, it was just really awesome, and I think that's an awesome combination of like VR and AR, where VR, you practice it at home, you know, and kind of safely get an understanding of the sounds of that environment. And then AR, when you're actually in that environment, you can get, you know, awareness of where you are in, like, internal structures. And I guess that's the big thing with the work they're doing and lots of other groups are doing is to have a way to do internal navigation. And, you know, GPS doesn't typically work inside buildings, so this is a mechanism that shows a way to get really specific instructions inside of a building. And the GPS wouldn't tell you what floor you're on. Right, <laughs> right. Yep, and, it, and again, like authoring all of these instructions, you know, it, it, that's similar to authoring the virtual environment. And that's, again, why I think it's interesting. I mean, someone has to go in into the rendering of the environment in the app, you know, and label all these things. This, these prompts are like a, a coded mechanism. So it is just basically taking different text alternatives like room 2113 or room 200 and it's inserting prompts around that. So there is an object structure that needs text alternatives that label like basically the architecture of that building so that someone can use this app. But again, that's what I thought was cool about this is that they didn't just build it as like a one-off demo. They did have a whole infrastructure of like, well, how would you apply this to any built environment building? Um, and I guess this is where I look at like the work that I did at Chapel Hill, for example, where it's like, okay, so if you see these type of projects coming from academia, the only way that we would see this in like a mainstream, actually, you know, in every building is it became a standard, you know, like sort of like applying to the Americans with Disabilities Act or applying to some other act where, hey, if you build a building, you need to label all the rooms, you need to have these things work. So. We see this coming, coming from research, um, but I think it's really great. I think you should be able to navigate anywhere indoors with your app. Um, another one I wanted to highlight was the Apple Watch. So I had tweeted this. I don't tweet that much, but this one was worthy of a tweet. Uh, this is uh, Molly Watt, is a woman who is deaf blind, and she uses the Apple Watch um, integrated with Apple Maps to navigate. Um, so she said 12 taps means turn right at the junction or three pairs of two taps means turn left. So basically without having to listen to sound or audio directions, there is um, sort of a rich vocabulary into the watch for ways to take directions. Um, I, I literally took her quote exactly. I don't know what the hierarchy is of all the vocabulary of directions, but you know. 12 taps turning right, three pairs of two taps means turn left. I just think it's really cool to have a way to say that, again, we don't have to only rely on audio as the other mechanism for navigation. Um, so the Apple Watch is already demonstrating that there is at least a vocabulary starting for also taking vibration um, and taking that information to navigate in the world. All right. So moving on, 1.2.2 captions. So this is um, a display of Altspace VR. Um, I showed Altspace VR because they're sort of like, at least from my 
understanding of VR. They're like the Second Life, um, but for the Unity platform, they're a very popular social place to come and meet up with people in virtual environments. So they do have the ability to display um, chat information. And I did have to censor the screen grab because, you know, people aren't always nice in chat. But the idea is that this does work with CART. Like, you, if you have a chat mechanism inside of a VR space, you can have an awesome stenographer like Mirror by Night uh, providing real-time translation. Uh, this, this text that we're typing right here could be displayed inside of this chat room. Inside of, the, inside of the VR world. And so you could participate with a presenter inside of a VR world if you have a way to display text captions. And again, what's interesting is because there's so many people building experiences really quickly, I think it's good that Altspace VR has this alternate mechanism. Some mechanisms say, no, you've got to use your voice. You know, I've gone into a few worlds where they don't have an alternative. And so in that space, those would be totally cut off from a person that's deaf or hard of hearing because they're basically saying you have to listen to speech. Um, this is just to show another example. Um, this one's going to be kind of chaotic. And maybe as I was practicing this with Mirabai today, we were saying, well, people should just all learn how to type at a stenography speed. <laughs> But um, on the screen, we have um, a, a, the primary speaker from Altspace VR is kind of this black avatar with blue, uh, we'll call it a neckerchief and a mohawk. And he's talking to people. He, yeah, blue headphones. Yeah, I need help always with these descriptions. He's talking to like five or six people, five or six avatars that are just basically white um, avatars with no arms and like blue and green ties. Oh wait, the audio is not actually playing though. I'm going to play it actually, hold on, I'll play it out of my computer speakers. So inside of that space, uh, my point is that you have these avatars representing people, and usually in the space you do have um, labels to say like it's so and so speaking. And so the the real ideal is that if you could have the text alternatives or for the captions be associated with the avatar, you know. So in this example, I'm showing another rendering from Second Life, and there's an avatar in a wheelchair, and there's like a thought bubble above him saying, can you give me directions to the park? So in, inside of this, if you were another avatar looking at this going on, by having captions be associated with a specific speaker, you know who's speaking it. And I, I think that's, again, the complexity, just like if we are all sitting inside of this environment and Mirabai needs to caption who else is speaking in the room, you just have the exact same elements in the virtual world. But I guess the exciting part in the virtual world is you could potentially you know, tag those to potential speakers and have it have directionality, just like you have captions uh, in television and movies sometimes appear under who is speaking. That's something that I think would be cool to start um, seeing in VR worlds. And I guess some games, you would already have that, right? If they were, it wouldn't be real time, but a lot of uh, programmed games do have captions directed to who's speaking it. All right, sensory characteristics. Let's see if this demo works. So I'm playing sound from the back of the room. This is my uh, gimmick there. And um, what we know is to give, uh, you know, when we have a sound description, putting like knock knock or a description of the sound into to brackets is there. Um, one thing that I don't know, and I guess I'm curious with Sveta's input or other people's input, I don't know really directionality um, 
how inside of captions you explain if something's happening behind you or in front of you. But this is something that I do think is very unique in VR space, AR space, is that it is in a three-dimensional place. So you do have a lot of uh, current experiences even using things like a knock at the door behind you. And that's supposed to be your prompt to like turn around at, you know, with your head display and look behind you. And so in, in that case, um, the mechanism to actually display a notification of where the sound is coming from, um, vibration, text, flashes, um, I, do, I think that's something that needs to be put into the guidelines and needs to be part of the captioning is like, you know, because that, that's going to be more and more frequent, I think, in the VR experience. Um, now I'm going to show you a Bjork demo because I like to just keep rolling through demos. Uh, I got James Herndon from Equal Entry that I work with to write this description because in San Francisco I was like, it's just Bjork, I can't describe it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's Bjork. But here, here's a great description. Bjork's eyes are closed as she sings into a stage microphone. She wears a hot pink carnival mask with sequins and a veil, which gives her the appearance of a radiant jellyfish which I think is a really good description. Uh, <laughs> so we're basically I'm setting up though, like I saw Bjork she's al is always innovating in this space, something I, th I was really stimulated by at the performance of um, her most recent album was that she had a visualization of the sound going the entire time of the performance. And this is something that I think is, you know, could be really interesting for people that are deaf and hard of hearing to enjoy musical experiences more. You basically have a way to see when the bass drum, for example, hits in the song. There's going to be like a circle that displays at the bottom of the screen every time the, the kick drum or you know the lowest tone drum plays. And there's going to be visualizations of you know the directions of the notes the strings are playing. And Bjork's voice itself is also very expressive. And you know, for me, just watching the, con uh, the concert, it was really interesting to watch the pitch of Bjork's voice basically move up and down um, visually in the performance. But I just show this as something that I think is interesting in, in augmented reality, is that this concert, the entire time, they basically use the same uh, visualizations. Basically the pitch when it goes down, we're seeing these circles representing notes um, go down. When the voice starts, uh, which is going to be the next line, the, the pitch is moved up and it's visualized um, differently. As, as we move through this performance, there, I got to find where the kick drum is. You can see in this screenshot, there's basically circles that represent every time the kick drum hits. You know, and throughout the show, they had different visualizations of all of the notes um, that were being performed. And I think this is something that now with technology, it's pretty easy for people to run these visualizations on sound. And you, I feel like you can see a lot of things in current uh, games, you know, on mobile devices even, teaching people how to sing. There was uh, a recent performance on America's Got Talent of a, a person who is deaf who sang, you know, really beautifully and, and perfectly as a performance. And one of the things she mentioned in the clip package was that she used visual tuners to tune her voice, you know, to actually understand the pitch and know that she was singing specific notes. And I, I kind of immediately related to that, that, you know, there, there's definitely a connection of the visualization of sound and, you know, what's possible kind of now to make an augmented reality, you know, have more information than just say captions, especially for music. All right, so moving on to use of color, this is another augmented reality. I show this to say that this is almost the exact same plugin that you can run on your web browser, so like Color Doctor. 
um, you can look at something through this and you put on these glasses. It's called SimViz. This is also from University of Nevada. And while you're wearing the glasses through the eye hole, you're looking around the real world and you can turn on the color filters to simulate the different um, color blindness settings. So I always think back to when we had the presentation about color blindness here and the way that sushi looked, for example, through a color blindness filter. So if you don't know, sushi kind of looks really gross with certain <laughs> types of color blindness, it looks gray or black. Um, so you can kind of get that experience with this augmented reality which you couldn't, you know, when you're running this on just like a web display, but if you're actually looking around oops, um, the real world, you can actually see what, what's the real world look like um, to someone that's colorblind. And I think, you know, just interesting to say that there's no difference in the requirements around communicating information through color, but with augmented reality, you could start testing the real world in addition to the, um, you know, the, uh, the digital world. Resizing text. Um, so I took this quote um, from Ian Hamilton, did an awesome article, which is linked to in my notes, um, about common challenges in current AR, VR games. And one of the big ones is the text, the size of text as it's displayed in these environments. So this Jesse Anderson said, the Oculus home area looks really cool, but it's pretty much unusable for me. The main tiles area and smaller boxes on the left and right are purposely set at a virtual distance in front of you. There's no way to look closer or zoom in. And so a zoom 200%, 1.4.4, resize text, right? Like these things are exactly things that in these environments you shouldn't be setting like, you know, you've got to look at this text from this perspective and from this size. But that is actually kind of common in a lot of the current uh, you know, games or experiences that are put into these environments. So I'm showing from, this is really awesome. I recommend if anyone wants to download Second Life. I had a lot of fun <laughs> in this. Uh, this is called Virtual Ability Orientation Path. So there's a company, Virtual Ability, that's done a ton of work inside of Second Life and thought through these accessibility principles. So they actually have a world that you warp to, that you get all of these instructions of how to use the world and how to modify it for accessibility. And they have instructions on how you enlarge the text, you know, exactly what we're looking at there. And built into Second Life, there is this idea that you can walk up to any piece of text. So on the screen here, there's like a, a billboard of just like black and white text, a lot of text. It's hard to read in the screenshot, but you, you can walk closer to it, you can basically zoom into it inside of that experience. Like every, every object in Second Life does support that type of zooming. So I would say like, you know, if, if a company's looking for a pattern of how to do this, you know, it does totally already exist in, type, in that Second Life type of environment. Uh, the next one, 2.1.1, keyboard accessible. Um, so I guess when you think about the virtual world, like it's still interesting to look at it just from keyboard access. It's like people shouldn't have to use motion controller wands or a treadmill that they run on. You know, there's a lot of crazy demos we've seen of virtual reality controllers. I guess just the big principle is people shouldn't design experiences that require you to use a specific type of interface. You know, it could be that a person has no arms so they can't use the wand controllers. It could be a person that has no legs they can't use like a treadmill type interface. So the whole principle of keyboard accessible is really about don't make your experience require a user to have a certain type of input. Um, again, shown on the screen here, there's pretty varied differences currently in the things from different companies. Uh, HTC Vive has two wands that you're supposed to hold in your hand to interact with the experiences. Uh, the Magic Leap you don't hold anything in your hands, but you do basically wave your hands in front of, uh, you know, an infrared thing to control. Uh, the Google Cardboard, you have to be able to hold the cardboard up. I guess you could get strapped to put that um, onto your head. But you have just different types of technologies, and they, they may or may not have requirements for input mechanisms. So people that design and develop games 
need to be having this thought process of not assuming that everyone's using the same input mechanisms. I think currently that's kind of a good thing that we have this huge diverse ecosystem of devices because it sort of forces people, again from the capitalist perspective, not to design for like one input mechanism. They are already having to make sure they can work with like as many of these devices as possible. But if one became dominant, I think you could easily see that people would start saying like, well, of course you've got to use hand wands to interact in this environment. And that's where you'd start having, you know, these violations again that someone has to use the type of interface. Do you think there was ever a left, left sided Google Glass? Um, I don't, I'm not actually sure if there's a left sided or. Everyone I've seen has been the same. No, there isn't. So if you're, if you don't see out of your left eye, you have a left there. Yeah. Again, I think that's the whole that's the whole thing is that there's a lot more scenarios, I guess, to consider in the environment when you have sound always in there and you have these movement mechanisms. Um, some of these experiences are really just it's something you're wearing in your head. HTC Vive, for example, you are walking around in a room, and so you do have, you know, it, across the different devices, different challenges that pop up. Um, this was another quote from Ian Hamilton. So he said, even if your vision is one of room scale VR with 360 degree head movement and full hand tracking, that person who's playing without any horizontal head movement or locomotion at all, just using one stick and two buttons on a controller may still actually be the person who gains more from the experience than anyone else. And I think that is really interesting. Um, if you look at some of the biggest adopters of people in Second Life, or at least from what I could see from going around in Second Life, there were actually a lot of people with um, motor impairments, people, amputee communities inside of there. And so it almost seems to say, like, for people that were trying to build these experiences, maybe your first customers and the people that actually go in and use your experience over and over, they might actually be using that type of input, and they might be, you know, your biggest fans of your experience. And so similar to any other technology we work in, but I, th I thought that quote um, was great, and we basically just don't want to preclude anyone from enjoying these experiences. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. All right, so this is uh, basically the last big demo I had. Uh, this is a game that I was playing in HTC Vive. Of, uh, it's called Audio Shield. And in Audio Shield, you use the two wands um, to hold, each wand gives you a shield in the virtual reality experience, and then these balls um, are timed to the music as they play. You try to block the balls with either a red or blue um, shield. And so in this video, it's going to be some music playing. going to not play a long bit, but just to say that visually it's very kind of overwhelming. There's like a lot, there's, it's quite bright. And, you know, in my own experience playing this, I really liked it because I like to dance and I actually felt like, oh, maybe I'm getting a workout <laughs> in this environment. Maybe, you know, maybe I could get a great workout in this environment. But there's a lot of background information. It's, it's actually, it was very hard for me to actually stay in the experience more than like one song. And so in the, um, I guess just to illustrate, I did what I would recommend to anyone else to do if you want to have an experience. I actually searched out developer. Um, I found the developer. I told him I'm a huge fan of the Audio Shield game for HTC Vive. I think it's great as part of a home workout. I've been enjoying using my music with it. I wanted to request when the product gets updated to have a dark theme or some type of less bright color option. I really enjoy the game, but love to have a very basic black minimal background and less bright colors for the bright for the balls option. That would let me be able to play longer. And he was very receptive. I thought it was very cool that he wrote me back within like, I don't know, less than a week. Uh, Dylan Fitterer is the developer of that. And he said, sure, here's a modified stage dive skin. 
you know, it has a line in there. He basically said you need to change like a couple lines of code. You know, so luckily for me, I can I could do that, right? It's like available for me to try out. He called it use dark minimal mode. I just have to set that to true. Um, and then, you know, it's it's very simple logic, but I guess the point that I like about showing how simple this was was, you know, he had to design that and he he did do that for me, and it, it's, it's really cool. But it would not be much harder to have that be a platform-specific setting, just like on your iPhone. Uh, developers on the iPhone can query, does someone have high contrast settings requested on their phone? So you know, if there had been a way for me just to request that, he could automatically set that mode or set that experience for me based off of a user preference. And then other developers could also understand that. So I love that he did it, and I love that it actually like worked really well for me on this screen. I'm just showing a side by side to show that in the dark minimal theme, just taking out the black background. I mean, it really did make a difference for me personally, like using the experience. I did actually was able to play it longer, hopefully burn more calories. Um, yeah, or time. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's just the point, though, to say that I don't see any difference in what he did there to what you would already be doing in an iPhone experience or a web experience. But the problem is that if there's not that platform mechanism, it would be individual requests. And it would not be you know, a really easy or discoverable type of thing for users of these platforms. Um, and then wheelchair and reach requirements. So I wanted to get out of WCAG and say, again, I, something I thought was super awesome in virtual environments is this project was, uh, I'll ha I have it linked in my documentation. I can't remember which university, but they basically measured individual users' um, reach abilities. And so, you know, again, just common accessibility mantra, you know, people aren't all the same. One person's reach distance is not going to be the same as someone else's. Um, the ADA, you know, has sort of a, a, a range, um, but they have a minimum range of a reach distance. But this was showing that in uh, a VR environment, you could measure it specific to an individual and then show them basically an apartment they might be choosing to move into, tell them if they would have trouble reaching the counters like in that apartment or you know getting inside a, getting through a doorway um, so it was like a personalized way to look at potential apartments that someone was moving into to say you would have an access barrier here and again I think that's like a neat merging similar to the orientation and mobility for a person who is blind this is a similar idea for someone in a wheelchair to be able or w with limited mobility to be able to explore places before they go there and find out it's not going to be accessible to them. Um, so again, cool that it's research, but it'd be awesome to see that as like a mainstream item. Um, also in Second Life, they've actually made seating that's welcoming for people whose avatar is in a wheelchair. And I thought that's just, again, super awesome. Like these environments are often built exactly to scale. Like architects currently use VR, AR to show people, hey, this is the house that you're buying, this is what it would look like. Uh, so they are measuring everything to exact dimensions. And so it's just crazy that in VR you would have the exact same requirements. Like you actually don't want to build seating at like a virtual event where someone would be going to see a speaker present where someone in a wheelchair like can't get up, you know, to a certain location to sit and view it. And I guess those types of things have happened in Second Life, and it's something that that company, Virtual Abilities, learned from working in that environment for so long that these are sort of design constraints you should think about in the virtual world. Uh, here's a wheelchair ramp going down to the beach. I like that the beach I chose to go to in Second Life did have a wheelchair ramp. It's the only one I would go to. Um, <laughs> And lastly, um, I guess just continuing with uh, what I touched on at the very beginning, virtual identities, being yourself, not being yourself. I guess this is uh, something I think is super stimulating in the virtual environment is this idea that people that have, um, you know, say like a physical disability such as um, using, a, uh, having amputation amputees like having legs and use no legs and using a wheelchair or having crutches um, having any type of assistive device it seems like all of these have already been 
gone through inside of Second Life, and there's a whole array of options of these um, products, basically, that I think some of these might be for sale, some of these might be things you just get, but the avatars can you know, use these objects and can present themselves that way in the virtual environment. And you know, I think that's something that, again, I mentioned, I think it's missing from almost any digital representation of avatars in most experiences. So it's neat to look at that in Second Life and potentially learn from that. Um, I, I, I can't even remember the, I was trying to be really current here, but this was to say like there's this, this attack or there's this, um, you know, concern when people portray themselves as like someone from a minority group that doesn't actually have that disability. And this is a movie I think called Blind, but where um, Alec Baldwin is playing a blind actor. Um, I guess you, we would have this exact same problem in virtual reality. I guess if we make these available, people can take on these identities. And um, at least from what I've seen, I guess, you know, kind of expect that on the internet. But I had seen, I guess, it go the other way inside of the virtual world of people being like inappropriate with those avatars. So I, I show that as like, well, technology and sort of the open world of um, technology. I think we we would expect to see like other mechanisms of that. Um, and in, in this environment, you know, there's kind of like an Android version of an amputee, um, an elf version of an amputee, and then, you know, different kind of um, maybe sexualized portrayals of amputees, which I think has also been popular in Second Life. So I guess, you know, it kind of comes with all of these things that when you create the ability to have a virtual world, I guess you have to consider all of these discussions. Yeah. So I, um, I, I just have a question in terms of that, because, um, you know, when I spoke at NYU, like a bunch of doctors, they're assigned as part of their training to spend four hours in a wheelchair. And I also, um, I participated in a webinar with another group. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I, I run workshops on self-esteem. So there was a self-esteem program that they were doing heavily based in research. And one of the things that they were doing with participants is allowing them to experience Second Life. And the woman who was running it loved it because she could be an able-bodied person within this world. And I was a little horrified for myself. I mean, based off what I would want. not. Obviously, it's up to her what she wants. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at is, wh what do you think that line of appropriateness or inappropriateness is? Because isn't there some value to having empathy or having experiences? For example, my best friend's three-year-old daughter, there's a cartoon where they have a little girl with braces and, and a cane. So she started walking around as if she had braces and a cane just because she wanted to be like that little girl. And, you know, it, I thought that was actually great um, that, you know, just like any girl would want to be a princess or a unicorn or whatever it is, <laughs> um, that she was actually incorporating this very sort of new thing. I, I, I guess it would be just a general question. What do you all think is appropriate or inappropriate? Because it's really... It's a delicate thing, I think. And, and I, I basically agree. It is a delicate thing. That's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to illustrate it is that I feel like I already see that this is so not mainstream. I probably most people don't even know about the the renderings and the references in this world. But I feel like it does open up all of those questions. You know, personally, that's why I'd say I, I don't I don't know. I think it's a, it is a good topic for discussion. Anyone have? The, the person with disability that has to go into the second world and live without is an option. I guess the. Could you speak into this? Oh, sure. Yeah. Here, into this. Yes, it's better. It's better. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking that there's probably more sense that. Sorry. Uh, there's probably more sensitivity about somebody able bodied simulating someone with a disability than there is if the person with a disability opts to go into second world and experience it without. 
So I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm thinking that it is probably more in one direction than it is in the other, that the sensitivity exists. Me personally, I feel like if somebody makes that option, as long as they're doing that, you can, and you can't um, regulate intentions, I guess. But I mean, for me, if somebody's actually genuinely curious of what would be, what would it be like if I were in this wheelchair, or you know, I wouldn't personally be offended by it. But I guess you, uh, how can you really say that? I mean, you don't know what people's intentions are necessarily. But but yeah, so it's. It's just something I've been thinking about, so just posing that as a sort of thought bubble for a leader. Yeah. And, and one more comment around that. Sorry. I, just, um, one more comment around that, just from our own experiences at Google, where we talk about doing things that can be empathy building. And the concern there is, for example, this idea of very simply, you know, putting on a blindfold and then simulating. Um, blindness or, or sitting in a wheelchair and then you'll know what it's like to be somebody who is in a wheelchair. And of course anyone who's in the community knows that that two-hour experience is not it and indeed might have the opposite effect where you conclude that's an awful thing, not realizing all the other mechanisms and abilities that people develop. So that might be the sensitivity about I think I'll just try it on and then I'll deem myself an expert in that area. Well, actually, that was one of the comments that I made at NYU. I was like, well, you, because they were all, oh, four hours was a long time. I said, if I, if, if I were the professor, I think you guys got off easy. I would have given you a whole month. Because then you <laughs> developed, you did, right? right. Um, because they were, they even admitted that they picked a four hour period where things were easier for them so they wouldn't have to, let's say, go on a date in one of these or. Um, so obviously, how real can it be? Right. Um, so yes, yes, yes. All that being said, I agree. It is. There's a comment in the back first. Yeah. We're gonna get it set. I just wanted to add about the movie, about the the blind character. Uh, played by a non-blind person. That's kind of a different story because that's not really related with the game world, but more talking about employment for actors with disabilities. In Hollywood, there are many great actors with disabilities, but less than 1% actors are hired for the roles. So many roles with disabilities are mostly played by actors without disabilities. So many people in the disability community, in the disability community are upset about that, so that's kind of different than kind of this portrayal of the people. And also people without disabilities still can't show emotions of what it feels like with this disability. It's better if you hire uh, somebody with a disability for those roles. Good actors, of course. <laughs> I think I, I I was in a quick referential moment there saying, you know, trying on identities, but it, the, the major issue that Sveta brought up that I agree is, so it's, it's about employment and, you know, ensuring that people with disabilities have the opportunities to have those opportunities um, in the enta entertainment space. Wale, did you have a comment too? Uh, yeah, I'm speaking loud enough, do I need to use? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like yes, sounds okay. like the caption. All right. Cool. Uh, totally agreed about the acting. You know, uh, and getting actors with disabilities is very important. Um, and I think there is this uh, strong. Uh, uh, the, the community is just strongly against simulations of disability 
because you never know what the person's going to get out of it. And it's, you know, it's most, most of the times assumed that it's just going to reaffirm negative ideas they had about the disability. I, I sort of found a, a, a way to, and I end up doing a lot of disability awareness trainings, and I found a way to sort of flip that inside out by not simulating the disability, but actually just simulating the experience of inaccessibility. And uh, so I just like, I asked for like a sighted volunteer and I hand them a, like a sheet of braille. And I'm like, here are your instructions, go ahead, read them. <laughs> And 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 the, you know of course like the answer is like, I don't know this and you know and I, I end up sort of having the social attitude that goes along with it and, and just being like well you, you don't read Braille do you read it all like what do you read like you know and just kind of like sort of just giving them the the, the usual workaround of like oh I'm sorry I didn't have enough money in my budget for print or you know. <laughs> Try to try to request it ahead of time next time, and I'll try to try to have it, but probably not. Um, and then, and then uh, Cameron actually helped me find this form online, so I asked him, "Hey, uh, you can fill out this form on my laptop right here, and I'll email email you the info." And it's a form that's screen reader accessible, but there are no actually no visual labels on it. It's just like some boxes and dots on a page. Um, so like, you know, in that way, I think it, it, it sort of simulates like what it's like to be in your own shoes, but like have that experience of not having access to something, you know, in, in the three ways, like the physical sense of the trail and the social attitude that I'm giving them and the, you know, the virtual in terms of the, the laptop. I think there's there's at least three like but I think I mean unity is the one that I, I've just personally used so it's the one that I have uh, the most experience with but um, yeah I, I believe Google and Facebook both have environments and there's also um, another major game unreal not unreal but there's no is it unreal okay yes it's like unity yeah any, I guess, specifically like screen reader uh, accessibility features in Unity, Unity experience, like games or experiences built on Unity? Uh, so my my understanding, like, and I, I believe, anytime there are these accessible experiences in those environments, it's basically you created a dedicated, you know, you created the speech interface, you created. The captioning interface so you basically built it yourself so there are examples of those but i don't believe there's any way that you you could tell someone that had built something else hey implement this and and you'll be accessible like that's that's what i'm not i'm not aware of any like api or way that you would take advantage of like a system level thing you have to build it yourself um, so I'm going to end with um, this last example was from uh, Chapel Hill. This is where I actually graduated from. Um, I, I just love this example just to take it out of tech a little bit. This is students. Basically, they have a, um, a day where people that are low vision and blind um, come to Chapel Hill, and the undergraduate students and maybe some of the graduate students build different experiences for students from high school and middle school students from around North Carolina. Um, to experience. This is basically an augmented reality one of a NASCAR experience. It is North Carolina, um, where we have a subwoofer and we have students that are actually on the ground um, shaking a chair and simulating um, the experience of like going around curves. Um, I'm just going to play this, but just to say that, you know, low tech is good too, and I think the experience matters. You know, so much more, and I, I just always, anytime I'm talking to tech, like I do like to say, like sometimes the most fun experiences, right, are just interacting in the real world. So we'll play this clip at the end.
So there's also a fan blowing wind in her face as well to like simulate that. And you know, I just think it's, it's awesome. Like you didn't have to program a bunch of stuff in Unity. You just need to set this up and make this experience. And I mean, by far that was the most popular experience of all the, you know, most of them were computer experiences. So I filmed, that's the one I filmed and thought was really interesting. So to close, um, talk to VR, AR companies about accessibility, all the demos and videos and uh, research papers that were kind of run through in this presentation are all at this bit.ly link and we'll post that um, as well to the meetup page. Um, thank you, this is my contact information and have time for a few questions at the end. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yep. Yeah, so um, I really liked the UMass Amherst example that you showed. Um, that was awesome. Um, what came to mind was something that I know a lot of game devs are really excited about right now, which is SLAM, uh, the simultaneous localization and mapping, uh, like that's going to be in, that is in Apple's AR kit. I'm wondering if you've seen anything like any kind of application of that um, in accessibility. Because it seems like that would be an amazing application of it. <laughs> Yeah. I have not seen anything with SLAM, and that's a new acronym for me. Okay. Now I have so to read about SLAM. It's like, um, the, uh, it's like the dream of AR where you can kind of permanently uh, put things in artificial, in, in virtual reality. Uh, so you, like, your phone will effectively know that where it is relative to the world around it. Wow. Yeah. So it seems like that would be awesome, but I don't know, maybe it's too new. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm interested with Apple's AR kit. Like, I have not done anything with that personally, but I would have, I guess, pretty good expectations that Apple is putting accessibility stuff into that. Um, but I, I don't I don't actually know myself. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was looking at some of the recent developments that we have, uh, especially when it comes to, like, computer vision and object recognition. And I was just wondering, like, is there a space where this could be good for uh, analyzing a VR role and sort of like doing some form of automated captioning or retrofitting objects in a virtual world with metadata? Um, do you think that's something that like, could help bridge the gap? Because you know, for web, we have the same problem of like most developers not bothering to like add to add the correct metadata and. In VR roles, I kind of feel like um, most developers are not aware. So this would this be like a good bridge? So I think uh, this seek and tag, which I didn't talk about, but it was cool. That was the idea of that project. Was I? I don't know what logic they put in, but it did look at Second Life objects and be like, that's a chair that's a table. So it, it did have some type of analysis it was doing on the object, I guess, properties to identify them and add the meta metadata. I, I would say like, I, I think it's great to have that, but the perspective I come in is like, if the author that creates it, if we had a requirement in a way to say like, you have to provide it, it's just always gonna be a better alternative if the person that creates it. But I think there should be continued work in that. And I mean, as we, as this quote was showing, I mean, we have to assume it's going to be the same. Um, at some point in the virtual reality, so 350,000 objects, 31% just called object. And like I said, I'd love to see the rest of it because most of that percent is probably still not, you know, a, a very descriptive text alternative. But, yeah. Uh, a couple of thoughts on that too. Like, the <coughs> camera, uh, computer vision is very good at some categories of recognition. Like faces, um, certain types of objects, text. But um, the problem is when you start to get it wrong, um, you have to have an extremely high confidence threshold, or else you're creating a misleading experience for someone who's blind, for example. So that said, like having an augmented exp augmented experience where you could say that there's 20 people in the room. Like, that's interesting, but it's not a replacement um, for uh, basically human descriptions. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I agree with Thomas, the best time to 
do that would be either when you're off of authoring the content in the case of like a, a VR space, or um, in the case of like a, an augmented reality, you kind of have to offload that to a to like a, a third party service. So it becomes expensive in that case. Um, yeah. Actually, it's such an interesting idea whether there have been ever any attempts to say crowdsource, and crowdsource with a rewards and awards. This is a space that can give them to you. Yeah, there's a there's an app called Be My Eyes, um, which is a service for blind and low vision um, people who can request uh, help from sighted individuals through uh, an iOS device that. Um, you know, basically an army of volunteers are on call essentially for um, really kind of like task rabbit style um, mechanism where you crowdsource it, it's like simple, it's synonymous, it's really straightforward, but in aggregate it, it is um, really meaningful. Uh, the other... There's the museum of natural history uh, here in New York. Uh, they're crowdsourcing image descriptions of it. Uh, they're crowdsourcing image descriptions for pictures that they have on their site, but also just kind of around that they have, because they have tens of thousands of images that have no descriptions. And so it's a site that you can sign up for. Uh, the thing that they're doing that's kind of cool is you can not only submit uh, descriptions, but you can also uh, vote on descriptions written by other people. So that yeah. way they can kind of quickly identify, like, oh, this this description happened to get like 50 downvotes and one upvote, it's probably crap. <laughs> or this image got like a whole bunch of upvotes and some downvotes, it's probably okay or maybe even some tweeting. Yeah, I'd also like to comment that that, that was built on open source software, so, um, so any organization can create a crowdsourcing uh, project. Uh, uh, care about lots yeah, of yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's built on an open source uh, framework uh, that, that's used to crowdsource um, extracting metadata out of digital assets, digital images. Just a volunteer for them? Yeah, yeah, it was developed by uh, the New York Library. I think the hardest thing with, with augmented reality is, is the real time aspect of it. Like, Doing it asynchronously, doing it in a crowdsourced fashion over time works pretty well. But like, if you're walking through a space and you need some any any level of sophistication and description of the content, um, right now you basically well, I, I don't I think you would need to pay for that. Um, you basically need to like mechanical turn it, and that's very expensive. Yeah, I was going to comment. I didn't show this video, but I, I'd like to show it because it, it was also a very cool uh, project from Carnegie Mellon uh, that they did. It's called Facade. Um, facade was basically an idea that someone could take a picture of a device inside of you know their home that they basically need to use. This, the example was a microwave. You take a picture of the buttons on the microwave. You upload the picture. To Mechanical Turk, and they do a 3D printed like to scale overlay that like they ship to the people and put it on the device, and then all of the buttons have the Braille labels for the device. So it was really cool. Like uh, th they use a dollar bill to like set the scale, you know, for how to, to print that out. But um, I definitely think that's a really cool idea too. That it's like, of course, not everyone's going to have a 3D printer. At home, but they de they were Carnegie Mellon's done a lot of Mechanical Turk uh, uh, projects, and I, I I do think they've done a lot of that work of figuring out like how do you make sure that the Mechanical Turk contributors, you know, some of the fault tolerance, right, that they didn't just do a bunch of tasks. But yeah, I thought I, that's linked to in my I links. This video is definitely really cool too. That's like a neat idea of like how you could take AR, 3D printing, and you know, crowdsourcing to make. Uh, old hardware or old devices have an accessible interface. Yes, Antonio? I think it takes the, the, you know, also the right tool for the right thing. 
when, for instance, uh, comparing IRA to BMIIs, those are two virtual, virtual assistant apps. One is very expensive and paid for by, uh, and, and with professional describers. And I would love to use that to navigate the streets of New York because I, I miss out on New York when I'm walking around. I don't know what's, what I'm going by. On the other hand, when it's a quiet something like a sunset, I took me in my eyes and I said, oh, the sunset is at 8.23 today. I went out in the backyard and me in my eyes was open. Uh, I was in Providence that day and connected with somebody here in Brooklyn and he described it the changing colors of the sunset. And I didn't know there was a shape of a sphere that ends up disappearing off of in front of you. But the, the different tools for different things, it, 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 you have to pick the right thing to work with. And I would love to someday just walk and know what I'm walking by in New York and have a sighted description of that with, say, bone conduction headphones. And it, it, it would have to be something like that, but picking the right tool. So now this is in the wild and crazy and <coughs> futuristic, you know, how do you actually finance some of these things? But I think about the fact that, um, you know, relay services are paid for on the telephone by some insignificant tax that everyone pays on their phone bill, and that's what enables anyone to use that service, and it's free of charge to the users. And if instead of a fraction of a cent on our phone bill, we paid a few cents on our phone bill, could we actually cover all of these additional services as well? And I throw that out just as I throw that out. So. I was curious, I wanted to ask a question for uh, the blind people here about an app called, I don't know how to pronounce this, so I'm going to do my last one. Uh, it's iPoly, A-I-P-O-L-Y. Antonio? Uh, yeah. Uh, AI Poly, in my view, is something that sighted people think are great for the blind, for the blind, but that the blind don't really see a use for. <laughs> I, know, I know there's a bottle sitting in front of me, I know there's a three people sitting within this angle of me and I don't need AI yeah, Poly. Right. Um, I would, however, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good start to play with, uh, play with um, computer vision to where you can start experimenting with these things and take it to the next step. So if you take it to the next step and I can point to that door out there and it can see the elevator from this far away and tell me there's an elevator out there. If it sees it, great. If not, I still know there's an elevator out there. <laughs> well, I just want to say quickly, it's amazing to me. So two years ago, actually, how I met Cameron, um, I was a judge for an assistive technology competition, and I learned a lot about technologies that don't necessarily apply to me as somebody having cerebral palsy, but one of the other fellow judges and an exemplar was um, Gus. And Gus um, is blind. And, you know, uh, there were so many apps that we thought were cool, and he's like, I would never use that. So, for example, there, I don't remember the name of it, unfortunately, but the, uh, a group created um, an app that would say, you know, Coke can or orange sock. He said, do you know how messy my room is? It would take me hours to find my left orange sock if I were to actually use this. This is not efficient. It is not <laughs> useful for anything practical in my life. So um, so I, I find that really compelling and something you know, that I've taken with me past that experience to realize, wow, there's so many things that when you're outside of that experience that you just don't realize until you have those conversations or you live that experience. So anyway, just wanted to say uh, you're not alone in that. There's a lot of apps like that, especially, I think, for those with blindness. Um, because it's one of the easiest things to try to develop for in terms of a technological 
background. Like most of the things I would need are hardware, but I think a lot of it is is in a sort of false empathy, if you will. Mm. Yeah. So anyway. But yeah, yeah see the last the, the side comment on that is it might be something else. Like you said, it's easy to program for. My son studied engineering, and he said everyone's putting optical sensors into everything. It's not necessarily the the right solution for that thing. Okay, thank you everyone again for coming tonight. We're gonna wrap up. We have um, a, a couple more minutes in the space, so um, we have to be like out of here, doors locked by nine o'clock. So hang out for a few minutes, uh, get to know people a little bit, and then I'll let you know when I'm gonna be kicking you out. Um, again, I wanted to thank uh, SSB BART Group, uh, Mirby Knight and White Coat Captioning, Thoughtbot for the Space, uh, Jolie McPhee with Internet Society of New York, and all of you for joining us tonight. Go, go to our meetup group. It's meetup.com slash A11YNYC. And uh, we'll be announcing our follow-on meetups there. We have a meetup usually every month, first Tuesdays. So um, come back next time. And thanks again.